We welcome you to the program today. The title of the sermon, A New Covenant. It's based on Hebrews chapter 8. And so if you would, turning your Bibles to the passage, we'll be looking at it verse by verse in just a little while. Hebrews chapter 8, A New Covenant. The prophet Jeremiah foretold how the Lord will make a new covenant with his people. In Jeremiah chapter 31, the writer of Hebrews quotes a portion of this chapter in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. The reason why he quotes the passage is in order to prove the superiority of the new covenant. Hebrews 8, 2 to 12. He appeals to the Holy Scriptures in writing the epistle to the Hebrews. The writer briefly introduces the topic concerning the covenant. In Hebrews 7, 22, he says, By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Jesus is the surety or guarantee that this covenant made by God will be honored. Not only is Jesus a surety of a better covenant, he is also a mediator of a better covenant. Today in this sermon, we will briefly consider a prophecy and a fulfillment of a better covenant here in Hebrews chapter 8. Before we look at chapter 8, it might be helpful to look at a portion of chapter 7 leading up to our passage today. The author describes the perfect high priest and the perfect sacrifice. In Hebrews 7, 26 to 28, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. He describes the perfect high priest. He describes him, the priest that is fitting for us, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, one who has become higher than the heavens, one who does not need to offer up sacrifices daily, who doesn't need to offer up sacrifices for himself or even multiple sacrifices for anyone else, that he did this and he did it once for all. Here we see the perfect high priest. In chapter 8, verses 1 to 5, we see Jesus, our high priest. Chapter 8, verse 1, he says, now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. This is the main point of the author. What? We have such a high priest. We have that perfect high priest that he describes in Hebrews chapter 7. Sometimes People will be talking and others may say, get to the point. Here's the main point. We have such a high priest. Jesus, our high priest, accomplished his work in offering himself as the sacrifice for our sins. Every other priest stood daily offering their sacrifices, which could never take away sins. However, Jesus offered the perfect sacrifice once and is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. Hebrews 10, 11 to 13, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, 
which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies were made his footstool. Jesus offered himself for our sins on the cross. Again, we see in Hebrews 1 and 3, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And again, in Hebrews 12 and 2, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus offered the perfect sacrifice and sat down. He was not like those other high priests with their weakness. Verse 2, he said, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. Jesus is a minister of the sanctuary, a priest of heaven itself. The term minister is used in the sense of serve, serving, one who serves. In this case, in this context, a religious context, particularly that of the priest, the high priest. And so Jesus is a minister of the sanctuary. He's a priest of a heavenly sanctuary. He is a minister of the true tabernacle. In the Old Testament, we read about the tabernacle, the tent that was pitched or erected by men. Here we see Jesus as the minister of the true tabernacle one which was not erected by man, but by the Lord. This is the heavenly, not the copy and shadow. Verse 5. The one foreshadowed the other. This tabernacle is divine and eternal. One which the Lord erected, not man. Verse 3, he said, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Hebrews 5 and 1. It is necessary that this Jesus, as the perfect high priest, also must of necessity have something to offer. We see in Hebrews 7 and 27 that he offered up himself as the perfect sacrifice, once for the sins of the people. It's once and for all. Hebrews 9 and 14, he offered himself without spot to God. None of the other high priests could say the same. He offered himself as the perfect sacrifice without spot to God for the sins of the people, not for his own, but for the sins of humanity. Verse four, for if he was on earth, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. That is according to the law, the law of Moses, a priest from the tribe of Levi offered the gifts. Our Lord, Jesus, who arose from the tribe of Judah, Hebrews 7, 14, could not be a priest on earth, according to the law, as only the Levites could be priests. We see this in Numbers 18, 1 to 7. Our Lord, as priest, offered, after a different offer, a different order, a heavenly priesthood. Hebrews 7 and 20. Verse 5, he said, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. Priests who serve on the earth, ministering in the earthly tabernacle, serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly tabernacle. It is a contrast of type and antitype. 
the things of the earthly tabernacle, foreshadowing the things of the heavenly tabernacle. Here we see, as you study the Old Testament, you see how that these sacrifices were a shadow. They foreshadowed the, the real, the true to come, the heavenly, rather than the earthly. Jesus is also our mediator, Hebrews 8, 6 to 13. Verse 5, he said, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The Lord instructed Moses. He, he divinely instructed Moses. In Exodus 25, 9, it says, according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. And again, in verse 40, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. And so the Lord divinely instructed Moses. He showed him a pattern to follow. We see how meticulous he was in following the pattern given by the Lord. Even the tabernacle erected by man the copy in the shadow of the heavenly tabernacle was meticulously ordered. This shows the even greater excellency of the heavenly tabernacle and sanctuary. Now, if this was true, if all the details, the pattern is true of the earthly tabernacle, what about the heavenly? Verse 8, 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also a minister of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. As our high priest is in heaven, Jesus has a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also a mediator between God and man of a better covenant. By his death, he brought in he ushered in the new covenant. Hebrews 9 and 15, it says, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. Both covenants were established by divine authority. However, the new covenant is a covenant, a better covenant, in that it was established on better promises. These are the words written by the writer of the, the epistle to the Hebrews. The author later explains these better promises in Hebrews 8, 10 to 12. A better covenant. What does he mean? The writer of Hebrews describes Jesus as the mediator of a better covenant, Hebrews 8, 6. That this is a better covenant implies that there was an another covenant which was given earlier and so if you're having if you have a better covenant it implies that there was an earlier covenant to be better than and while various covenants are documented in the pages of the old testament the author had in view the covenant that the lord made with israel when he led them out of the land of egypt and so he delivered the children of israel from Egyptian bondage. He distinguished the earlier covenant as the first, the first covenant in verse 7. In Deuteronomy 4 and 13, we see an example of this covenant, this agreement made by God with the children of Israel. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And so here we see the, the first covenant. We see the law given by Moses, the Ten Commandment law. How that Moses received the law, wrote the ten on tablets, and brought it down to the people. Well, we see here that he describes it 
this new covenant as a better covenant, better than the covenant that God made with the children of Israel through Moses, the great lawgiver, the mediator. Hebrews 8 and 7 has said, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. The first was temporary and served its purpose. Galatians 3 and 19, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. We see here in Galatians 3.19 and also Galatians 3.24-25, to the purpose of the law. That the law, the law of Moses, was given because of transgressions. That it was temporary and that it would be added till the seed would come. The seed. And so that is Christ. Verse 24, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. And so the law served a purpose of bringing us to Christ. He said, after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor no longer under the law. The first was temporary, the first covenant, and it served its purpose. There was no remission of sins under the first. We see in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, the prophecy of Jeremiah. And we mention that today because the writer of Hebrews quotes this passage in the New Testament. Writing to the Hebrews, he cited the prophet Jeremiah from the Holy Scriptures in order to support what he had taught of a better covenant. This ought not to have shocked his readers, particularly Christians with a Jewish background, given that the Scriptures said that such would happen. From the Scriptures, the Scriptures of Jeremiah, the prophet of, of the Lord said that this would happen. Hebrews 8 and 8, it says, because finding fault with them, that is, the Lord found fault with the people, that is, the children of Israel, the people of the first covenant, saying that they did not continue in my covenant. And so they were supposed to keep the law, but they did not. They did not continue in the covenant given by the Lord. In Hebrews 8 and 8, he continues and he begins quoting a portion of Jeremiah 31, 31, saying, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The author quotes the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, in order to prove the superiority of the new covenant which the writer of Hebrews describes as a better covenant. The new covenant would be made with Israel and Judah, and that is the whole people of, of Israel. Verse 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. And so this would be a new covenant. A new covenant was needed, unlike the first that the Lord made with the children of Israel. The Lord kept his part by delivering the people from Egyptian bondage. The Lord is faithful, and the Lord was faithful to the covenant. However, the children of Israel were not faithful. They did not continue in the covenant. Verse 9, he says, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Since the people did not continue in the covenant of the Lord, the Lord, according to the writer of Hebrews, disregarded them. The passage in Jeremiah 31, 32 reads uh, somewhat different. 
my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Despite his love for them as a husband for his wife, they broke his covenant, and so he disregarded them. He turned away from them. And so my covenant, which they broke, they did not continue in his covenant. He said, though I was a husband to them, though he loved them as a husband, his wife, they broke his covenant. And so here we see, according to Hebrews 8, 9, he disregarded them. He did not regard them. Verse 10, he said, for this is the covenant which I, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. And he continues with the prophecy of Jeremiah with verse 33. This covenant was with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We see in verse 8. This new covenant is with the people of God. Among whom there is no distinction. He describes how the new covenant is better with better promises in verses 10 to 12. Verse 10, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. With the new covenant, God would put his laws in the mind and hearts of the people. This implies a personal knowledge of God. He would be their God, and they would be his people. And so we see the, the closeness. Similar language is used of the first covenant where the Lord promised Israel at Sinai that they would be his special treasure, his special people. If they obeyed his voice and kept his covenant, they would be a special people to him. We see this in Exodus 19, 3 to 6, and also earlier in Exodus 6 and 7, and also in Leviticus 26 and 12. And so the difference is that, according to the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord said, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And so rather than the tablets of stone, we see them written on their hearts, again, implying this personal connection, knowledge of God. They would be his, that he would be their God, and they would be his people. Verse 11, none of them shall teach their neighbor and none his brother, saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. As the Lord would write his laws on their hearts, verse 10, the Lord himself would be the teacher of his people. Like we see in Isaiah 54 and 13, taught by the Lord. People would, as we see in John's account of the gospel in the New Testament, people would become children of God, God's people, not by being born of blood, but by being born of God, John 1, 12 to 13. We see a familiar passage in John chapter 3, how that he speaks with Nicodemus, saying you must be born again. Here we see that in this new covenant, that people will become children of God by being born of God. John 3, born again, born anew. Taught by God. John 6 and 44 to 45, we see that the Father draws people to him. How? By teaching people. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so Jesus speaks to his disciples here in John 6, 44 to 45. And quotes the prophet, and they shall all be taught by God. 
And so we see this in the new covenant. God's laws would be accessible to everyone. The people would not depend on experts to teach them God's laws so that they may know him. There would be no distinction between the people of God for all would know the Lord. He said from the least of them to the greatest of them. Hebrews 8, 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Remission of sins is the heart of the new covenant. It makes it a better covenant. Hebrews 10, 16 to 18, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. And so with the first covenant, there was the reminder, the remembrance of sin, despite the offerings of the priests. Here we see that with the new covenant, that the perfect offering would be given and that there would be remission of sins. The first covenant lacked remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 10 and 1 and 4, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Here we see how that the new covenant is a better covenant. In those sacrifices, he said, there is a reminder of sins every year, verse 3, but no remission of sins. Hebrews 10, verse 11, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. With the new covenant, God had greater promises, and God promised their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Hebrews 10 and 17. He, under this new covenant, would no longer remember these sins against them. Jesus offered up himself as the perfect sacrifice for sins once for all. Hebrews 7 and 27. Hebrews 8, 13, he says, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The Lord, through the prophet Jeremiah, spoke of making a new covenant in verse 8. The term new implies that the first is old. According to the author of Hebrews, the Lord made the first covenant obsolete. With the new covenant, the author says that the first is ready to vanish away. We might ask when. As was foretold by Jeremiah, the prophet so long ago, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. And so he anticipates that this would happen. He foretells this in the prophecy. Hebrews 8 and 8. The writer of Hebrews writes, quotes the passage of Jeremiah. The author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 8 and 6, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. 
underline the word now. When? Behold, the days are coming. And in the days of the writer of Hebrews, they had come. But, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. He is mediator of a better covenant. That covenant established on better promises. It was then. It was there. The death of Christ involved the coming of the new covenant. We see this in Hebrews 9 and 15. He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. When? Jesus died on the cross. Jesus gave his life as the perfect, spotless sacrifice. Prior to his death, Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's Supper, a memorial of his death. Matthew 26, 26 to 28, Jesus is with his disciples. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. As Christians, as we observe this memorial, the Lord's Supper, each and every Lord's Day, each first day of the week, which we call Sunday, we remember that Christ died for our sins. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And we, we have the pleasure, the honor of participating in this communion with one another and with the Lord and remembering his death that he died for us. Jesus gave his own life for, for our sins. We hope that this lesson has been helpful. Before we dismiss today, we ask the question, do you believe the gospel? The gospel is the good news of salvation, justification through Jesus Christ the Lord. Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Jew and Gentile, everyone, everyone who believes the gospel is the power of God to those who believe. Do you believe the gospel? In Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus gave the Great Commission. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Do you believe the gospel? We hope so.